Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues, euh, bienvenue à notre troisième journée de notre conférence. J'espère que vous avez passé une soirée agréable et que vous avez eu l'occasion de profiter de ces, ces beaux temps et le bel environnement ici à Ottawa. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third day of our conference. In true Canadian style, I want to begin with an apology. Canadians seem to begin by saying, I'm sorry. Um, you may have noticed there was no uh, coffee available when you came into the hall this morning. Um, I was also looking for it, but then I remembered that I decided not to have a morning coffee session. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with uh, this uh, CARFUMS conference is to um, sort of have a, a stripped down and, and basic uh, conference, not pay $12 a day for tablecloths on the round tables. and one of the calculated decisions was to not have uh, a, a coffee break, before, a coffee available before the morning plenary. Um, so I, I, I am with you in solidarity in, in uh, feeling the consequences of that, but I'm delighted that we have such a motivating speaker this morning that that will more than adequately compensate for the lack of uh, caffeine uh, at, our, at our disposal. Um, this is our uh, third uh, keynote address, uh, our first keynote address by Osama from the Network of Refugee Voices, really challenged us to think through questions of the inclusion of refugee perspectives, not only in the global policy process, but in the research endeavor as well, and what a dialogue with the refugee perspective looks like. Uh, Heaven Crawley's keynote yesterday really challenged us to think more critically about what it means to have impact and policy impact in our research and to be very aware of the power relations between the research community and the means by which knowledge is produced and if and how that then has an impact on the policy process and whether that impact can be discernible. And it's interesting, as if on cue, uh, late last night I received an email from uh, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada uh, informing me and perhaps many of you that the International Metropolis Conference, which is a, a grand jamboree intended to bring together the research and, and practitioner communities around the world, that the International Metropolis Conference will be held in Ottawa in 2019. And they've sent me a poster that will uh, put up around and the website will be up soon. But the secretariat for that will be out of the research and evaluation unit in Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. So it will be an interesting opportunity to take Heaven up on some of her challenges uh, on the, the role that research might play in, in setting the agenda. But today's uh, keynote and the theme that we want to uh, address today is the question of a north-south dialogue within research, or perhaps I should say a south-north dialogue. Um, the inclusion of, of this theme in the, uh, in the overall objectives of the conference was motivated very much by a piece that um, Lauren Landau published in the Journal of Refugee Studies in 2012 on the tyrannies of partnership, on this notion that research centers in the global south play a very important role within the discipline in hosting researchers to conduct research, but that the results of that research are then taken back into uh, academic communities in the global north where it's published and careers are built, but that the true partnership does not accrue to research colleagues within the global south. The, an earlier version of that paper was produced in the context of the Refugee Research Network that was headed by, by Susan McGrath, and I had the real privilege to sit down with Professor Koti Kamanga at the ISFM uh, meeting in Kampala in 2011 and really try and talk through what this paper meant and to think about how individuals within the research community could begin to change some of the power dynamics that are there. It's been a, a long conversation in the seven years since then. Uh, in uh, the session, um, one of the sessions at 11 o'clock, we'll be launching uh, a book series with McGill Queen's University Press that includes provisions to uh, include uh, titles by scholars from the Global South, and we hope that that is a, a very small step in addressing some of the imbalances in the political economy of knowledge production that Lauren Landau first, uh, uh, or, or not first, but that he made clear in that piece. And so today I am personally and, and professionally really 
honored and privileged that we're able to invite Professor Koti Kamanga to present to us on questions relating to the uh, refugee situation in the Great Lakes region of Central Africa, but more generally the state of the research community within this region, and questions on how partnership can be more critically self-aware of these realities and what true partnership looks like. I really can think of few people better placed than Professor Kamanga to challenge us and to speak to this reality because he himself has been a true pioneer in fostering a research community in the Great Lakes region of, of East and Central Africa to try and sustain critical engagement with issues of forced displacement. You will have read in his biography about his, his academic credentials, but what I want to highlight is that uh, Professor Kamanga was the co-founder and the long-serving director of the Center for the Study of Forced Migration at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Now, to say long-serving director is an understatement. By long-serving, I mean 14 years as director of the center. And under his uh, vision and under his leadership, the center played a leading role, not only in Tanzania, but in the region, on issues of, uh, of, of capacity building and training, journalists, civil society, workers within the field, generations of graduate students, and in hosting foreign scholars coming to Tanzania to conduct their research. And here I want to make a very public admission of how I have abused uh, KK's hospitality over the years. Uh, beginning in 1999, when I first went to the Center for the Study of Forced Migration as a young and profoundly naive graduate student, arriving with the wrong visa. And uh, as I was trying to explain myself to the immigration official who said, well, no, you can't just walk into the country, suddenly out of nowhere appeared this guardian angel who is Professor Koti Kamanga, who somehow magically made everything fall into place. I may still be languishing in immigration detention in Dar es Salaam if it weren't for Kete. So, asante sana Rafiki. In KK's own scholarship, he focuses on issues of international humanitarian law, in public law, in refugee law and policy, uh, especially focusing in the Great Lakes region but beyond. He's been a real uh, citizen to the discipline, serving on numerous editorial boards, as you'll see in his biography. He was a two-term secretary for the executive of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration. He is a, a, a scholar of repute and a tremendous citizen who has worked very hard over the decades to do that which he is now going to present to us. And so as I said, it is a, a great personal uh, privilege and a, a great honor to ask you to please join me in welcoming Professor Koti Kamanga. Karibu Rafiki. I was barely able to recognize myself from <laughs> I was telling Jim that I was barely able to recognize myself from what he's just said about me. <clears throat> uh, uh, thank you uh, so much. It's an honor to be with you uh, as an outsider uh, uh, of the association, but also of the uh, continent. My presentation is in PowerPoint uh, precisely because I want to use numbers, uh, and numbers don't lie but they create a problem when you have not memorized the numbers, but also because I'm not a native uh, English speaker. English and Russian, Nadia, are my third and fourth languages. I have two uh, uh, first languages, so that is why the presentation is in, is in PowerPoint. Uh, I'm told I have about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, I've got about 20 or so slides, uh, so help me God. <laughs> uh, uh, now, uh, these are the issues that I want to address. They may, ap may appear to be a long list, but uh, uh, don't be afraid, it's uh, going to be truncated. Uh, in the first place, to, to share with you uh, what is the status of forced displacement in the Great Lakes region. 
meaning how big the problem, uh, the problem is so that we have a sense about uh, what we are talking about. So that is the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that uh, if that is the situation in this part of the world, in the Great Lakes region, what are some of the paradoxes, the ironies that are arising out of uh, being a, uh, a preeminent uh, a center of uh, forced uh, displacement? And the paradoxes in relation to the issue of um, research and knowledge exchange. So that is two. And three, we will engage also in a blame game. Uh, if, that, if these are the paradoxes, if these are the ironies, who is to blame for this mess? Who is to blame? Uh, especially who is to blame for the symmetry in, 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 in endowment uh, and, um, uh, and resources, the inequality of arms, uh, the disparity in, uh, in resources? Who is to, uh, to blame? Now that will be general and therefore we'll have to step down and focus concretely uh, at these African institutions, African universities, African research centers, but uh, specifically the University of Dar es Salaam as, uh, as a case study, and precisely the issue of uh, research funding. What is the status of research funding at the University of Dar es Salaam and, and other universities in similar, in similar situation? Okay, so we will have talked about the the paradoxes, we'll have talked about the challenges, and then the question is, is it all about, uh, about doom and gloom? Is there something somewhere that is good? So we will move on uh, to look at some of the success stories, if I may call them that way. And finally, of course, uh, if these are the challenges, if these are the opportunities, what does this tell us about what we are intending to do with this collaboration that we are about to discuss uh, the north, uh, the north south, and about the north south in a minute. Uh, okay. Now, uh, a few uh, preliminary remarks. Uh, north south. I have uh, personal reservations about the use of these terms. It's not that I don't understand what they mean, but I think for the general public, when we talk about when we use the term north and south, the immediate impression is that you are in a geography class. Right? When actually that is not the issue, when you're talking about north-south, uh, we are basically talking about the issues of the inequality in resources and endowments. Uh, that is the issue. So it's not an issue of geography. It's an issue of resources. It's an issue of inequality. So in my presentation, I would rather use, especially for the south, uh, I, I, I cannot pretend to impose uh, on those in the north, but in so far as the south is concerned, I think it would be academically honest to talk about the least developed countries, to talk about, to talk about the underdeveloped south, and not simply, and not simply, simply the south. So that is one. Two. Uh, I also, in my presentation, will not pretend to theorize. I'm not here to, uh, to present new theories in, 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 in the issue of refugee or asylum uh, in the global refugee system. No, no, not at all. Uh, but rather, I want to take this opportunity to share with you uh, the brutal facts, the reality on the ground, uh, the circumstances, the environment within which African research centers do work. Uh, what are the factors, what are the conditions that they have to, uh, to deal with, especially again in relation uh, to research and uh, uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge exchange. Uh, now, uh, uh, Jim here and other experts, they will tell you that there's a lot of politics. Right, there's a lot of politics in the global refugee system. I want to assure you there are also politics. There are also politics in uh, research and knowledge, and knowledge exchange. And those are the figures. Those are the figures uh, that try to capture these inequalities, uh, not only general inequalities, uh, but also in a specific relation to uh, specific relation to research and knowledge exchange. So one against 99, right, 20%, uh, right, uh, uh, accumulating, uh, 95% of the global wealth and uh, the 80% of humanity is left uh, to deal with the remaining 5% uh, uh, of the bread crumbs. So this is the reality we live in. And uh, this has uh, led some authors, these are not my words, uh, uh, 
uh, authors whose names I can share with you. They are now talking about a global apartheid, right? They are talking about transnational capitalist class, and even, uh, and Lord forbid, they are talking about also a transnational capitalist state. So this is the global reality that uh, we live in. This is the global reality we live in, and the global reality which in turn, which in turn uh, determines what is the, uh, what are the politics in research and knowledge uh, uh, exchange. Uh, uh, what we should do, we should do next, uh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> This captures, I think, uh, in, 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 in a flash second, what we are talking about, what we are talking about. So it's not simply a question of global north and global south. This is what we are talking, uh, we are talking about, right? What is fashionable in, in, in one part of the globe actually is, in other words, is poverty. Uh, uh, in, now, this in summary, this pie chart, uh, captures what is Africa's um, uh, contribution, if you may call it that way, in relation to issue of forced displacement. You easily see that the, 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 the Africa's share is, is 30%, right? Uh, followed by the Middle East, right? So quickly, it is clear uh, that if you put the 30 and 26% uh, uh, together, it is very, very clear who in this, who in today's world uh, bears uh, the, the burden, the, the bulk of the, the burden with matters of uh, uh, forced di di displacement. Uh, now, uh, so the paradoxes, I, I pointed out one, the key thing that I want to share with you are the paradoxes that arise out of, uh, uh, ar arise out of uh, being uh, a major uh, host uh, of uh, displacement. So, the the Great Lakes region is an epicenter, is no doubt, statistics, statistics are very, very clear, right? Now, the, the paradox or the irony is that uh, the situation, uh, forced displacement, right, uh, manifests itself in a very concentrated manner in countries uh, of the South, right? And yet, the experts, right, the experts, right, uh, and world-class research and publication is located not where the problem is, but in the global north. And so this is, this is the, 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 the paradox that I want to share with you. So if I'm Tanzanian, I'm from the Great Lakes region, if I really want to do meaningful, polished, acceptable research, I must come either to Ottawa as I've come, which I've been to the library, or I should go to Toronto, right, to go to York, Right? Or I should go to uh, Georgetown University, at the uh, institute, uh, Susan uh, uh, Forbes Martin uh, joined, or I should go to the, uh, the, uh, the refugee and uh, refugee study center at Oxford, right? Or I should go to Geneva, right? I should go to Geneva. Uh, and incidentally, uh, incidentally, this is not uh, 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 isolated, it's not an isolated situation. It is not only in relation to forced displacement. Even in other areas of knowledge, it's the same problem, right? You, the, the, the problem is in the south, but the experts and the research centers are in the north. In East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan, we have what we call uh, our European Union or our NAFTA, right? And incidental also in our NAFTA, there are people who are difficult and some are spoiled. But that's a different story. <laughs> so we have an East African community, right? And guess what? If you want to do research on the East African community law, you have to go to two places. You either have to go to the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, because that is where there is the East African community law center, research center. Or you have to go to Germany. You've got to go to the University of Bayreuth because that's where the leading research center on East African community law is located. Uh, so, uh, technology, technology. Uh, the, the next, uh, the next uh, slide, which is not coming on, uh, 
Yeah, it's an anecdotal evidence, but important nevertheless, which emphasizes what I've just said, which I've just said, uh, in that uh, I am uh, from Tanzania and others like me who went to into refugee studies, you would expect you would expect that we would be very very familiar. We would be frequently visiting uh, refugee and IDP sites within our neighbourhood, right? Uh, there was a presentation here yesterday uh, about um, IDP camps in northern Uganda, Gulu. Uganda, uh, Gulu, Uganda is only a thousand miles from Dar es Salaam where I'm staying. Uh, the Refugee camp, the largest, I think, the ref up, uh, up to until recent, Dadaab in Kenya, is barely 665 kilometers from where I stay, in, where I live in Dar es Salaam. Uh, likewise, uh, the, the, uh, the, D the Eastern DRC, which is uh, a preeminent source of refugees, is barely 1,000 kilometers. But I've never been to these places. I've never been. <laughs> Instead, I've been to Abkhazia in, in Georgia, right? which is 5,000 5, miles away. I can give you a detailed description of the, of the lives of IDPs in Abkhazia. Right? I can, uh, I can, I've been to Brazil uh, for a meeting of the International Association, of the, uh, International Association for Forced Migration. Uh, and likewise, this is my second visit to Canada. I've been to York. Susan McGrath, thank you. Uh, now I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in Ottawa. So this is my second time in Canada. So I've been, I've been able to travel five, 7,000 miles from my home base, but I've not been able to travel 600 kilometers. Why? Because the availability of research funds, right? The, refer, the, research, the availability of funds, the funding cycles, is such that it allows, it allows me to go uh, far off lands, but not next door, where I, where I, where I live. So. Uh, Oh, goodness. Yeah, so this is a, uh, before I get into, into the nitty gritty about the status of uh, research funding in my university, as a, as a way of background, as a way of background, to show the contrast. Again, we sh I, 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 that's why I, I keep repeating, uh, I find the use of North-South very uncomfortable because they don't honestly portray what you are talking about when you say North-South especially when you're talking to the uninitiated. If I met a, a, a high school Canadian and I told them I'm from the global south, they will ask, uh, you from Venezuela or the Caribbean? Right? Because for them, south is a geographical concept. Right? It doesn't say anything. So uh, this is the reality. This is the reality uh, in which uh, our partners in the north find themselves. Right? Very, very elaborate institutions numerous institutions, but also considerable resources are uh, channeled towards, um, uh, towards, uh, towards uh, research. Uh, now, uh, the next uh, slide uh, should be on uh, the funding situation in the University of Dar es Salaam, and it's not coming up. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. I think it's this one, yeah. Uh, now, uh, each year the University of Dar es Salaam, which is a public university, creates a budget. That budget is presented to government, right? So you have an approved budget from the University of Dar es Salaam, it is sent to government with the hope that government will approve, right, and remit, right, the amounts that have been requested. But in reality what happens is that when you submit uh, a budget, it gets approved, right? Not all of it, the percentage of it gets approved, but even when it is approved, even when it is approved, what you receive is less than what you requested, right? And it comes in bits and pieces and often late, and often, and often uh, late. Uh, and a good example is the 2008 and 2009 budget, which uh, uh, the amount of money that was remitted was only a third of what was requested. And yet it was in that very same year that enrollment had peaked, right? Enrollment had, had, had peaked, but uh, the budget uh, uh, allocations were, as I'm uh, trying to point out here. Finally, of course, uh, for the, I've been teaching for the last 27 years of the University of Islam. I've never heard of anything of this sort. For the first time, the university announced that there is a 
pot of a pot full of money, right, and academic staff, faculty may apply for the research. But it turns out, uh, given the number of faculty and the amount available, it turns out to two thousand three hundred dollars per person, right? Which is essentially the sal the monthly salary of a professor. And the question I'm asking, because there are a number of graduate students here doing research, I'm asking you whether what you would have done, what would you have accomplished, which is meaningful, if you were given $2,300. Uh, next. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the situation is the same. University of Nairobi. University of Nairobi, this, it's the same. Right, 60,000 students, right, enrollment increasing by 40% every year, but budget increases, right, only by 4.5%, right? Now, in such a situation, I'm asking, would, would, would we be wondering, should we be wondering why University of Nairobi is not on the top 10 of universities, global universities? Why is it not along with Toronto, McGill, British Columbia, right? This is the explanation, right? Should we, in these circumstances, be wondering and asking ourselves, why is it that the University of Dar es Salaam, in terms of global ranking, is at position 2021? Sh should we be asking? Should we be wondering? Probably not. Uh, University of Nairobi. Now, some of the challenges, some of the challenges. So those are budgetary, budget, budgetary uh, constraints. But there are also other constraints. And I'm mentioning these, uh, I keep, I, I'm repeating, because these are rarely mentioned, uh, rarely acknowledged. And as a result, uh, that's why most collaborative uh, initiatives between the North and South uh, have problems. Because these details, these peculiarities, these challenges are not acknowledged and therefore they are not responded to, they are not uh, uh, taken on board uh, adequately. Now, <clears throat> uh, the issue of, uh, we have a problem of staff uh, outward mobility, faculty exiting universities, both senior and, and junior. Uh, now, what, what is the implication, the immediate implication when faculty exits, it means the few that remain Right, must shoulder the, the burden. Because you cannot shut down a university simply because two, three professors have exited. You don't do that, right? What it means that those few who are remaining must shoulder, must shoulder the burden. But they are so few and they are so overworked that they are simply not able to do research. They're simply not able to do, uh, do, do research. And if they do research, then the outputs are very, very modest in terms of numbers, but also quality as well. Numbers as well as, as quality. Uh, now, that again, we have got a faculty of around 1,500, the entire University of Dar es Salaam, faculty 1,500. But these are the outputs, right? You can clearly see the graph that in each area there is a downward trend. Whether it is journals, fewer and fewer. Whether it is research reports, as he, with years, with time, they are becoming fewer and fewer. Uh, published books, they are becoming fewer and fewer and fewer. The anecdote now, the final anecdote. Uh, 1,500 faculty. They are about 600 plus uh, computers available to 1,500. Now, even the 600 computers that are available to faculty, it is only 500 that are actually hooked onto the internet. Only. Only 500. And this data, by the way, is from the University of Dar es Salaam itself, from the facts and figures. If you go into the website of the University of Dar es Salaam, you can Google facts and figures. You, so I'm, I'm citing this. So it's, it's not, my, uh, my, not my estimates. Uh, the problem is not only staff. We also have problems with students. Ideally, ideally, at the end of each academic year, when students graduate, the university must endeavor to grab, to absorb the best students, right? This is conventional, conventional wisdom, common sense, as they say. Although, as they say also, common sense is not common. Right? Uh, so what happens at the, <coughs> at the end of the academic year? At the end of, OK, in the first place, uh, we had a moratorium. No recruitment uh, for 10 years. Not a single academic member of staff was recruited for 10 years. We were told the country was poor. All right? So that is one. Uh, now. Uh, so as I said, not all 
uh, bright students at the end of the year get absorbed. Uh, very few get absorbed. But even the few that get absorbed into this public university, also with time, they also exit. They go to the private market because the private market pays. The, the, the private market uh, uh, pays. So at the center for the study of forced migration, having seen this problem, we decided that no, no, no. We must make a succession plan. Uh, I, KK, I am here today, I'm a, I'm a simple mortal, I may not be there tomorrow. So there must be a succession plan. They must, I must prepare, right? I must prepare those that will take up, uh, will take up the banner. So f for this period, for the last, uh, for the last 20 years, we've been trying to groom students uh, uh, so that they join us at the center uh, and take up refugee studies as their, as their career path. Now, of the five that we've been trying to groom, only one has remained. Only one has remained of the five, right? Of the five, only one uh, has, has, has remained of, of five. So we have staff, uh, we've got faculty exiting, but also we have a problem with retaining students interested in this, in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, area. Okay, we said fine. What should we do now? We approach UNHCR. Listen, UNHCR, we have this problem of succession, right? Please assist us. We have created this program. It's a short-term program, two-year program. It's intensive. We'll bring uh, junior faculty, uh, run them through the basics of refugee law, policy, psychosocial, and the like, uh, so that uh, we have a succession plan. Uh, UNHCR supported us only for two sessions, and then donor fatigue set in. They dumped us like a hot potato. Okay, we said fine. Maybe we should do. We should create something that is more durable. So we created now a master's program um, to begin with, uh, LLM in refugee and migration law. Thinking that uh, this is now uh, a panacea, <coughs> a panacea from uh, of donor fatigue. Again, UNICEF came in with enthusiasm, uh, threw around money, announced, uh, gave scholarships to students to take this, but that also didn't last long. Actually, it, it was so bad that in, on, on one occasion we even suspended offering this program because we did not have the minimum threshold of students for the course to take off. I think that's the arrangement every university. You must have a, a minimum number of students. So we were not even able to get uh, the, minimum, uh, the minimum number, such that I think the program now uh, is in the intensive care unit. Uh, As if that is not enough, we have other problems as well. In addition to mentoring, uh, whoops. Okay, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, not all <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom. We have things, uh, uh, that uh, weren't popping uh, the champagne, uh, the champagne bottle. What are some of these? Uh, we were into a collaboration uh, arrangement uh, with the uh, University of Oxford, the Refugee Studies Center, with funding from Ford Foundation. What did it allow us to do? Uh, uh, first of all, it, it allowed us to send one of our colleagues, uh, Bonaventure Rutinwa, to go to Oxford to do a PhD in refugee law. Until that time, there wasn't a single Tanzanian with a PhD in refugee studies, right? So that's the first thing this uh, 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 contribution allowed us. It also allowed us to set up physically from scratch, literally from scratch to set up what uh, is now the center for the study of forced migration. It allowed us to travel to Oxford to the uh, refugee study center to, to create course outlines, to gather teaching materials so that to return home and set up these courses in the various departments across the university to begin teaching uh, refugee studies for some of us to teach refugee law, others to teach in demography, others to teach in geography, and so on, sociology, and so, uh, and so, uh, and so on. It also allowed us now, in, because we had uh, funds to travel to international fora, it allowed us to get internationally uh, engaged, to participate actually in the founding conference of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration. We all, it also allowed us to launch what we call the 
East African School on Refugee and Humanitarian Affairs, which was a short-term program that targeted mid-level management people and policymakers. Because we discovered when we went out in the field that when you go to these refugee camps especially, you find that you, there are people out there that take decisions, uh, the Mike Malloy's of their time, that there are people who take decisions on refugees, but without any specialized knowledge whatsoever in this area of refugee studies. So that is why, in response, we created this short-term program, the East African School on Refugee and Humanitarian Affairs, which was targeting people like camp commandants, project program officers in refugee camps, <coughs> but also policy makers <coughs> in uh, in government, and it targeted the entire region. It was not only meant for Tanzania, but Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and, uh, and Burundi. I'm still within time, right? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so that is success story number one. Can pop the champagne uh, bottle for that. Uh, but there was a second one. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, my apologies for torturing you. There, there, will be, there will be wine, I think, in cocktail, but uh, success story two. Uh, again, Ford Foundation uh, dumped us, abandoned us. Uh, again, funding cycles, and I'll come to this. Find funding cycles, they abandoned us. Uh, they said that, okay, you, 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 they wind us off the, the, the milk, so they abandoned us, and in came uh, uh, John uh, and Catherine MacArthur Foundation. Uh, they tried to, they helped us, they provided money uh, to consolidate so that there's continuity from what we were doing, right? So they helped us build uh, communication infrastructure. We did not have telephones, we didn't have a fax, we didn't have a scanner, right? They helped us there. Uh, they helped us uh, acquire uh, books and subscribe, we began subscribing to journals, Journal of Refugee Studies and so on and so forth. Uh, we were also able to continue rolling out ISRA, the East African School on Refugee and Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, it also helped us uh, to retain administrative and support staff. So that there's somebody doing administrative work, we're like, I'm able, well, I'm going to class, or well, I'm doing uh, research. Uh, uh, it also uh, allowed us to be noticeable uh, and to join international uh, research consortiums, uh, one of which was uh, led by Georgetown University. Uh, but also it allowed us the capacity to hold international workshops to bring policy makers of the region together. Uh, and share with them our concerns, what should the law be like, what should policy be like, what should be the practices be like, right? Uh, so this is what it uh, uh, did in summary. And then also, uh, with this international visibility, we also uh, get to be noticed by University of Malmo in southern Sweden. Uh, they became attracted with what we are doing. Uh, they uh, got us into uh, a collaboration, but on in the issue of staff and student exchange, they discovered that uh, their students would benefit if they came to our country to study, to, to study for a semester. Uh, we also noticed that we also stand to benefit if our students went to Malmo, spent a semester studying, taking exams, and returning with credits. We also discovered that we have, as lecturers from the Great Lakes regions, have experiences that are unique, uh, that should be shared by our colleagues in Malmo, so we were traveling as, as a faculty to teach, uh, to research and supervise students, and we also discovered there is merit, there is value added to get somebody from Europe to talk about uh, European Union law rather than me struggling, right, going to the library, trying to uh, struggle to prepare a, a lecture uh, on jurisprudence of the, of the European Court uh, uh, of uh, Justice or the Court of Justice of the European Union, as it's formally. Uh, so they were success stories, uh, and these are some of them. I've skipped some of them. Uh, we also got funding from Andrew Mellon, by the way, uh, foundation. We also were funded by uh, the Danish uh, uh, Development Agency, Danida, but I'll skip that. Uh, uh, let us move on to... S so, in summary, in summary, uh, 
this collaboration, this funding from our partners in the north, what did it in summary allow us uh, to do? In the first place, it may sound mundane, but th at that time it was very critical because it was not easy to convince the University of Dar es Salaam that there is value in introducing into the curriculum refugee studies. It was not easy. It was not easy. Because as you know, the, the syllabus is always tight. Each time you are trying to introduce a new cause, a new discipline, it means displacing uh, an existing cause or uh, reducing the time for which it, so it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. So we're glad that that initiative was validated by the successes that I've talked about. Uh, so we not only introduced individual causes in the different departments, but we were also uh, able to upgrade uh, it uh, into a master's program. Uh, we built capacity to host, uh, to host uh, a number of uh, North-based uh, North uh, scholars to do their PhD. Jim is only one of them. Uh, there was uh, a student, uh, Lauren Lando from the USA, did his PhD at the center. Uh, uh, there's another one from Sweden, uh, to mention only, uh, only uh, a few. Uh, the collaboration also allowed us to create capacity, as I've said, not only uh, in Tanzania, but also for the entire region. For the entire, uh, for the entire region. Of course, it gave us visibility. We began to procure consultancies. Uh, we began publishing. Uh, we began in began uh, to be invited by government to offer our, our our thoughts, our ideas. But also, more importantly, and this is particularly relevant for us, uh, for the network for refugee voices. Uh, increasingly, the centre became a channel through which refugees who are who are both rightless and voiceless. At least they found a forum through which they could air their, uh, their grievances their, uh, and, and, and aspirations. So that is in summary. Uh, so if these, uh, if, these have been, if these have been our challenges uh, and if these have been the opportunities, uh, what does this all tell us? in respect of what we are about to discuss, which is now the collaboration between the Global North uh, and the Global Least Developed, the Least Developed Global South. Uh, the first one, uh, again, this is rarely uh, mentioned, I, and I don't know why, uh, academic honesty must uh, point to the fact that uh, uh, these institutions in the least developing countries are in a very peculiar uh, a very peculiar uh, situation. Uh, when McGill and Toronto uh, sit down to collaborate, I think that is one thing. Uh, it is totally another thing uh, when Toronto wants to collaborate with an institution in the global, uh, global south. So the peculiarities which I've tried to summarize should always be borne in mind, should always be borne in mind, should always be borne uh, born in mind. And uh, one thing, for example, is the historical ties that these institutions have with the national governments and nations, right? Uh, universities here, there are some universities here in, uh, in Canada. There is one university, I forget which one, was formed in 1828, right? So that is before even Canada came into being, right? So that, that is a, that's a, that's, that's a, 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 a it might appear trivia, but that's very important because the University of Dar es Salaam, for example, was established in October 1961. It was established even before independence. We gained our independence in December, right? But the African, the new government, right, created the first thing, the first thing that the new government did was to create a university. With what purpose? With the purpose of having an academic institution which would assist the new African government in furthering national development goals. Right? Uh, in training personnel that will uh, occupy the positions that will be vacated once the British uh, colonialists leave. So, so, so th this might appear trivia, but it's very important. So <clears throat> it's very important, why? Because academic <laughs> institutions uh, in the South, University of Dar es Salaam in particular, and many in similar situations, were not created as forums for critical thinking, for developing theories. No, they were created, unfortunately, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but the reality is that they were created to deal with very, very mundane things, right? So if you are a professor of physics, 
right? Uh, you will you not be theorizing about the quantum and, and so on and so forth. Is how, as a professor of physics, what should I do to, to have physics taught in secondary schools well? So it's that mundane, that's mundane, right? So uh, th that's why I began that I, I'm not here, I, I will not pretend that I'm, I will be here, I will be theorizing. I will just share with you the brutal reality uh, 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 of, the, uh, of the circumstances that we, uh, we deal we deal we deal with. The second thing that we should uh, also be aware of is that these uh, countries in the global south, uh, including the institutions, including the research, uh, uh, research uh, centers, are under considerable uh, uh, pressure from international financial institutions. Why? Two things, right? They are told uh, repeatedly that higher education is not a public good, right? Governments, it's none of government's business. This is something that should be left to the private sector, right? right? At most, you should just exercise regulatory, regulatory powers. Secondly, that certainly you should cut down. You should cut down your expenses, right? And that explains the budgetary trends that I mentioned earlier on to the extent of only approving a third, right, of the re requested, requested amount. So, so these two things, but also uh, a third thing. And the third thing is that, uh, and therefore, quick fix, quick fix interventions are unsuitable, they are unrealistic. And I think the experience that I've mentioned, Ford Foundation came in, abandoned us, right? They came to fix, to quick fix, right? like a plumber, right? Uh, MacArthur, Andrew Mellon, UNHCR, Danida, all of it is a quick fix. Let's go in, right? Let's, 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 bomb, let's bomb Iraq and bring democracy, right? And where is Iraq today? Right, so quick fix uh, is unsuitable. So the, the, the funding cycles, the f conventional funding cycles of three to five years, right, is has proven, has proven, in, from experience, has proven to be unrealistic. It's unrealistic, unrealistic, unfortunate, right? Uh, now, but the answer is also, again, the answer is not to go into this overambitious, right, overambitious interventions also. Right, so we shouldn't uh, be in, in the pendulum mode. Right, we're switching from one extreme to the other extreme. Right, quick fix, and then we go to overambitious interventions. No, let us uh, bite what we can chew. So explore uh, short-term interventions. Right, but which speak to one another. Right, which speak to one another. So short-term interventions, but with the greatest uh, potential for building capacity. Uh, but also continuity in what these institutions are doing. And finally, uh, which is fifth, uh, is that uh, uh, it is worth asking ourselves, and from an economic, an economic point of view, you always ask yourselves, what advantage do you have over others? So the only advantage that I can quickly see of institutions in the least developed countries in the global south are two, right? They are proximate, through the situation, whether it is the question of IDPs, whether it is the question of refugees, uh, whether it's the question of mixed migration flows, right? Whether it is the question of testing uh, migration and development, right? A, B, A, T, E, T, C, they have that advantage, right? But they also have an advantage of uh, dealing with this issue for a considerable period of time, considerable period of time. Tanzania, for example, uh, <coughs> Uh, hosted the first influx in November 1959, right? So you're talking about a country which uh, for half a century has been dealing with this, with this issue, right? So uh, that is the way uh, forward. Uh, as uh, to finalize, I want to say arigato gozaimasu. Our Japanese friends will tell us what it means. I thank you for your kind attention.
Thank you, Professor Koti Kamanga, uh, and from a fellow African as an Ethiopian, and, and you were my role model, like when I was reading about uh, an African scholars. Uh, thank you for uh, showing us what forced displacement in Africa means, what the paradox of research uh, and the knowledge exchange means for the continent of Africa between North and South, when Africa, uh, the continental Africa is hosting 30% of the refugees. Uh, who is to blame and going with, with uh, 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 love, going, uh, who is to blame for that? and telling us at the same time the success stories of what is going on with this gloom between North and South and, and, and the difficulties that we are facing. Uh, it's wonderful to see all, and the details that you are giving and it reminded me what the difficulties we are also seeing, those of us who are coming from uh, Global South and doing research in Global North, uh, especially in the resettlement area. And the challenges we face are the same as those North and South. Uh, to do a research in resettlement, I have to uh, collaborate with someone who is from the North to get funding, to get publication. It's the same kind of thing in a different way and how power and uh, careers and resources are located in, especially for North and South. So, it opens at the door, where are we going from here? And, and how are we gonna do this knowledge exchange when we have the details between, uh, for the last three days, when we saw Professor Crowley's exchange in policy and research, and when we saw the refugee network, and when we saw your conversation that we are having today, it's the third day, we need to think through what will this collaboration, what this knowledge exchange mean? So I hope we are going to discuss with that, with your, your questions and in, in this session. Uh, I have a problem with my leg, so I'm going to use as a leg. So questions for Professor Koti, if you can come back again. And you can use the microphone. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to just be side I can stand. I can stand. Yeah. You want me to sit? Thank you very much, uh, KK. I'm going to be um, selfish and, and, and jump in with the first question. I mean, your, your presentation was very compelling and, and, and very challenging. Um, and what I'm left with is, on the one hand, you, you present the image of how knowledge production and the research enterprise in the global south, in, 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 in the East African region, to avoid the, the labeling of, of the global south, that it's constrained by these deep structural forces of global capitalism and, and, and the global asymmetries of power that we see that go well beyond refugee studies as a discipline. But yet we're left with the tools of these very short-term, sporadic, five-year partnership, seven-year partnership, two-year partnership, the funding that's very episodic. And your conclusion is to uh, you know, build on the capital, the, the comparative advantage of proximity and to invest in capacity building. And what I want to, to, to do is, is to really say sort of within that model of, you know, if we have, for example, a, a seven-year partnership with some resources that can, you know, capacity building, but is there a way of thinking do we accept the global structural forces that continue to perpetuate these asymmetries of power that continue to marginalize academic communities in East Africa relative to the accumulation of wealth in the global north? Can we think of a way where the, the, the sort of very immediate short to medium term investments in capacity can challenge those very hegemonic forces? Or do we say that the investments that we make, that we, that we are playing a long game and that it's not a question of what can be accomplished in, in five years or seven years, it's a question of trying to invest in that next generation that maybe there is a perpetuation 
of capacity, not a challenging of the deeper structures that create these conditions. So, I, I, it's, it's, it's a, you know, I, you, you said not to theorize, but, you know, do we, do we accept these power relations and do our best to work within them? Or is part of the capacity building to try and unsettle those power relations? And if so, how, how do we do that? Uh, to, to stimulate uh, debate further, I, I want to, to, to indulge you just one second. I, I did point out that uh, one of the things that we should engage with is the, 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 uh, blame, the blame game. And it's unfortunate because uh, of the uh, operation of this uh, gadget. I was at, I skipped uh, I skipped uh, a slide. Would, do you mind if I get back to the slide? It is also part of this uh, uh, question. That could I go back? to the sorter, if you go to the sorter, there would be uh, there would be a slide whose title is Who is to Blame? As we go forward, it's, it's a continuation. I, I, I did point, I wanted to point out uh, that uh, we, 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 unless we, are, we want to be ahistorical, but if we want to pay homage to history, we have to bear in mind that these are countries that have come from this background, right? Slavery, uh, colonialism, but more interestingly, uh, we, Africans themselves have a, a fair share also to blame. Africans themselves. They've been uh, a huge case of African misrule by the political uh, class. Uh, so <clears throat> these are just examples of some of the characters that we want to, uh, to point out. Mobutu uh, Seseseko, DRC, amassed a stupendous wealth, uh, $15 billion. Right? Dos Santos of Angola, again, $20 billion, $20 billion, not Canadian, US dollars, by the way, US dollars. Right? Uh, who else? Uh, Paul Beer, Cameroon, 200 million US dollars. Uh, but I think the jewel in the crown is uh, uh, Jean Bedel Bokassa, right? who spent 20 million US dollars for his coronation. President of the Republic was not, was not good enough for him. He wanted to be emperor. So he spent 20 million just for the ceremony, the coronation ceremony, which was uh, one third of, of the state's revenue, just for his coronation. Right? So, Right. Uh, thanks. Now, uh, Jim, uh, two things. Uh, if you can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, join them. Fighting uh, the global hegemonic system is not an easy thing, right? It requires mass mobilization across countries, across the globe, right? And, and, and there are examples, and there are examples where it succeeded, right? In fighting colonialism, right, there was global consensus that colonialism is unacceptable. The UN even adopted a convention, right, which then justified why the rest of human, humanity should support those countries that were fighting uh, for independence, were waging anti-colonial wars. It also succeeded in the war against apartheid, right? The, UN, the United Nations also sat down, adopted a convention that apartheid is a crime, it's a serious crime. So that motivated, mobilized uh, nations uh, to challenge, to challenge apartheid. Because if South Africans, for example, they were left on their own to challenge apartheid, I think the story would have been different, right? So the same thing with global hegemony, right? It can be challenged, but the resources uh, that are required are considerable, are enormous. So as we wait for that to happen, as we wait to happen, let us do what is doable. As we wait for that uh, moment, let us do what is doable. That is, get into collaborations between institutions in the north and those in the less, less privileged south, right? But bearing in mind the peculiarities that I have 
uh, tried to, to summarize and put across. I can say only that much so far. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so I'm a PhD student now at McGill and uh, I think the irony in your presentation is very stark and uh, I want to be more specific to my own situation. Uh, as a PhD student um, and specifically to be funded for this conference I was given like 1100 US uh, Canadian dollars to come here and so the the parallels between uh, what you've just presented and you know in colonialism are are overt and since we're all in this room sort of learning and and wanting to to understand more and exchange knowledge I think we're all we all have a role to play in this we all do perpetuate this system by writing reports or or playing into the academic capitalistic society so I'm wondering in what ways uh, do you feel as if a conference these conferences where we eat and talk and share things and money's just being thrown around uh, for my own situation are are in fact beneficial or is it more sort of um, morally and ethically uh, considerate to think about the realities of, of exchanging knowledge in a way that actually advances um, platforms and, and situations where instead of maybe a third of uh, professors at your university are having internet, uh, maybe I don't come to a conference. I mean, does that that exchange. I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but there's just this stark, stark reality of uh, starting with with us as individuals because we're all part of this problem, whether directly or indirectly. And so, if we don't sort of uh, personally reflect on how our our positionalities are affecting this perpetuation, then I think we're doing a disservice. belong to an LDC and I agree the north-south <coughs> terminology is very misleading. Um, I have just two comments, questions. One is I think in our, um, <coughs> when will we stop, and by we I mean all of us in lesser developed countries around the world, being subjects of research for the North as opposed to being co-leaders and collaborators in topics and issues that actually concern us more directly in our own countries than in other parts of the world. Because like you say, um, the idea of not just having research institutions for countries, um, lesser developed countries in the North, uh, instead of them be actually situated and the knowledge coming from there, it's all coming from the North. And secondly, there's a lot of talk about South-South collaboration, right? That's the, these days, that's the buzzword. It's not North-South, let's all collaborate within uh, the Southern region. But that in itself, um, I mean, you've given the history of colonialism, slavery, corruption. The excuse is it's so endemic to countries like ours that we'll never be able to build that capacity that's needed even for South-South collaboration. There's a lot of politics involved as well, geopolitics across uh, within regions and between regions that actually stops us from having that collaboration. Um, so do you think there is at any point going to be, I mean, will, there, will we ever come up as leading researchers given the constraints that we have politically, financially, economically, and just socially the way we're viewed in the world.
thank you, Cody. I was, uh, you know, we who work with colleagues in less developed countries are aware of the challenges that we they face. We think they are, but it's, to have it so graphically put forward is really helpful and a, a reminder the 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 immensity of the inequality. And what I was particularly struck by was that the loss of journals and active journals. I mean, I guess I had the sense that you know things were continually growing. There was some you'd reach some capacity and could grow, but it's not. It, I mean, it's essentially in decline. And I think that, I find that, I mean, I'd like to speak at some point about that, trying to understand that. I mean, I, I guess it's all of these things together, but it's like the um, the pressure, I suppose, the global pressure and, and capitalism is, the pressures are getting worse. But I, I'm also um, interested, and I've raised this with you, um, in terms of how the importance of networking and whether there's some potential for networking. But I recall that there was a network, I think Dar Salaam, Moy, and um, Wits had a, a, a network they ran briefly. But I suspect that the same challenges, how do you maintain a network when you're having difficulty just keeping your own institution going? Because I'm, um, in 2008, UNHCR did a mapping of research institutions globally. Um, it was inadequate, it just, just, they just done short term in any way, but they came up with some very interesting recommendations and um, looking at how the importance of support for research in the institutions in, in the, they referred to as the Global South. That report didn't seem to go anywhere and, and the new Global Compact is now calling for uh, a, a global network of institutions and uh, I think they're um, and there's Penny Matthew at Griffith University has been charged with writing a piece on it. But, and I talked to her, but, so I think there's a, a moment here, I think somehow to try and raise this and really put forward uh, through the global compact process. If they're going to do this, then how do we really um, create some capacity and make this really true? The, the, these principles were quite good. They really recognized the inequality. But I think this really has to be taken forward. So I guess I'm, my question is around this this decline continuing, and do you think there is a, an opportunity here for some kind of shifting? The last one, so give you the answers. Ask. Do you want to answer those first? Well, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. It's kind of a question and a comment. I feel in part that one of the problems we have here, and there are many, and global capitalism is the biggest, so I'm not going to downplay that, but I wonder if there's an, in part a disciplinary problem as well, in the sense that, um, let me try and articulate this, the, the focus or the distinction between refugee studies and migration studies has all sorts of consequences, and we heard about some of those yesterday in terms of the way in which work is done, but I think it also has consequences for the capacity building issue, and I think that's a shorthand for lots of other things. So we're just currently, we've just submitted a couple of days ago a proposal looking at South-South migration, I get all the problems with that terminology, but on trying to build capacity around migration more generally, of which refugees are a part, because the funding, as you say, for refugee studies is typically quite narrowly framed and comes back to UNHCR and others, but migration, global migration, international migration is much, much bigger and also much more embedded institutionally in lots of the context that we're looking at. So I suppose Part of the question, and we're working with 12 um, migration institutes in the Global South around this project. So the question is, is there something about the way in which the discipline of refugee studies is organized um, that's problematic in this context? And if so, how do we hold on to the specificity of refugee studies whilst recognizing that forced migration flows are embedded within broader context of globalization and movement? They're not completely distinct or separate from them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, perpetually, when 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 uh, I've seen this from when when you are trying to uh, establish uh, a refugee study center, you're immediately uh, confronted with issue of. Uh, of terms, should, should it be a refugee studies center? Should it be 
Migration Studies Center? Should it be refugees and migration? <laughs> so it, it's very, very chaotic. Uh, it, it, the, the term refugees, fortunately, uh, is definable. Right? So if you say you are into refugee studies, uh, from, a, from an academic point of view, it's very clear what you are doing right? and who you will be dealing with, including policymakers who within government you will be dealing with. But if you, the moment you say you're into migration, then it is not too clear you are uh, dealing with, uh, in the context of Tanzania, for example. Even the policy makers that now you have to engage becomes, become very blurred because there is the Minister of Home Affairs, there's the Minister of Labor, there is uh, Foreign Affairs, and so on and uh, so forth. So I don't, I don't have an answer. To, I don't have uh, an, answer, an answer to that. Uh, uh, something that is open, uh, open to, to discussion, but I think uh, each institution will have to decide for itself depending on the peculiarities in which it finds itself in. I think if you are in a situation in which the predominant problem is that of refugees and IDPs, I think it makes sense to identify yourself with refugee studies. Right? I would say, for the moment, I would say, I would say uh, that. Uh, Susan McGrath, uh, journals uh, that we are subscribing to are less. Okay, you know there is this uh, talk. Each time you 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 are communicating with a, with a colleague uh, uh, colleague in the uh, global north, they will always draw your attention to the website. Please go and look uh, the online version of the journal. Blah 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 blah. I just pointed out that we have faculty of one thousand five hundred. Right? Of those 1,500, it is only 500 uh, computers that are hooked to the internet. Only 500. Right? Uh, and even on access to online journals also has to be paid for because not, it's not free. It is not free. So there are all those complications. Now, uh, matters have gone so worse uh, that even the few uh, journals uh, which are hosted by the university itself, they are also in intensive care unit. They're in intensive care unit because the editor is not given a honorarium. Right? The editor himself, who, as I said, there are few who on, on post because there's a huge exit, so there are few on post. So these few, they are terribly overworked. So in addition to his teaching and supervision task, he also is serving as editor, right? And how do, how do you get motivated, competent proofreaders, right, in that, such a situation? So even the few uh, homegrown journals, they are also in intensive, uh, intensive, uh, intensive care uh, unit. South South, uh, again paradox. Uh, the South South Commission, as you might know, the headquarters are in Geneva. In Geneva. So if you're Colombian uh, and I'm Indian and we want to discuss matters of South South, we, we've got to go and meet in Geneva. Right? <laughs> we've got to meet in Geneva. So that is one. But now the, 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 the beauty uh, of uh, least developed, because the question was whether we will, will, will we ever make it, right? That was your question, if I understood correctly. The, the interesting thing is that uh, countries of the of the South, Global South, uh, they are so institutionally weak that they are not run uh, according to systems, right? But much depends who is in the president's seat, right? So if it is uh, Jim, we'll be going one direction. The next moment, if it is Patrick, we'll go another direction. The moment it is Osama, we'll be going another direction. So, so the beauty there is that uh, if you have, if you have a true patriot, an enlightened president, right, he's in, a, in the shortest possible time, as is, as is the case in Rwanda, right? You have a president who's committed, right, enlightened, right? It's dramatic changes, dramatic changes, right? Dramatic changes. But in, in, the, in the old democratic, uh, democracies, such changes are not possible. Right? Because everything is run systematically. You have to go to parliament to seek permission. There's to be a bill. There's to be discussion in cabinet and so on and so forth. So, so uh, 
we have, uh, we have the flip side. The flip side is that we are really in a big mess, right? Uh, it calls for a lot of uh, pessimism, and I agree with you, but at the, at the other end, there's also a lot of optimism, right? But unfortunately, things uh, have been left to chance, right? Left to chance. It depends who next and who that will be, we don't know. When that will be, we don't know. Right? That is the, the precarious situation of, uh, uh, of our uh, uh, countries. Uh,